Well, good morning, everyone. I am Kevin Klein, and you just heard from Kira Provenzano of the MGA's member services team. I'd like to welcome you all to day two of President's Council Week and thank everyone for attending this morning's session, Financial Best Practices and a Link to Strategic Governance in COVID. The President's Council is traditionally one of the most important days on the MGA's calendar. And given the challenges she has brought to us all, we are pleased to be able to offer a week full of informative virtual sessions. The outstanding turnout underscores the great commitment we all have to keeping our clubs healthy and to support we get from the leadership of our member clubs. We hope everyone will be able to take something away from today's session and the remaining presentations this week that will help at your own clubs. The MGA works hard to help our member clubs navigate the challenges and opportunities that the game is facing. One of the ways we do that is by collecting and sharing information, acting as a resource and clearinghouse, and by conducting educational programs like today's. With this in mind, I think we have a very full and interesting program scheduled for you this week. I'd like to stress that this is intended to be an interactive week. The whole intention of the President's Council is to bring you, MGA member club leaders, together to share and exchange ideas and discuss what we feel are important issues facing clubs and the game of golf. This morning's presentation will be followed by a question and answer period. If you do have questions throughout the session, please type them into the question box and we will do our best to address them while we move along throughout the presentation. So again, we encourage your active participation and involvement. The MGA is committed to supporting our member clubs during this difficult time for everyone. We aim to over deliver and be the best we possibly be and hope meetings like today help in that goal. We wanna thank all of our supporting sponsors for this week, and we hope you will seek them out when they can be of help to you and your members. Please let Kira and I know if we can provide additional info on any of our partners listed here. Now we'd like to introduce our first speaker this morning, Ray Cronin, founder and chief innovator of Club Benchmarking. When we surveyed club leaders for topics to cover this week, many clubs were interested in learning the outlook for dues, capital X expending, spending, operational cost increases going forward, and other important items. You wanted to know what industry leaders were saying about expectations for the 2021 season for private clubs with COVID-19 still in the picture. I think we're all looking for fresh perspectives and Ray is here to share some with us this morning. Club Benchmarking was founded in 2009 after Ray became involved in the governance of his own club, Thorny Lee Golf Club in Brockton, Mass. He realized the discussions and decisions of the board and committees were driven by opinion and was concerned with the lack of data and fact. Since 2009, club benchmarking has created the market for data-driven insight in the club industry by gathering financial, operational, membership, and compensation data from over 1,000 clubs across North America. Club benchmarking's mission is to foster healthier clubs, more empowered managers, and more strategic boards by elevating fact over opinion. Ray's gained a reputation as a top-rated speaker for club manager, controller, and board education, has authored numerous industry articles and reports, and has presented to the boards, committees, and members of nearly 500 cl clubs across the U.S. Ray was selected as Boardroom Magazine's Educator of the Year in 2018 and awarded the John Fornaro Impact Award in 2019. Ray is a past president of Thorny Lee Golf Club and holds an MBA from the Harvard Business School. Once we get started, you'll know right away he's a Boston guy, but we won't hold that against him. <laughs> As all businesses have seen many changes due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we're delighted that Ray is with us this morning to discuss financial issues that clubs are facing and how clubs can address these issues. There's no question that clubs' cash flow will be impacted directly or indirectly from the effects of COVID-19, and who better to review all the important items clubs should be considering. Ray brings a wealth of knowledge on the ever more complex landscape facing private clubs today, and we're delighted he is here with us this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ray Cronin. Thank you very much, Kevin, and thank you uh, to the MGA for allowing club benchmarking to participate in this year's President's Council. Uh, it's different than the usual ones, but everything's a little different in 2020 than it's been in the past, which is uh, probably not a bad thing, actually. In the end, we don't want, it wasn't necessarily, you know, the best step route, but what the pandemic is evidently doing is accelerating change across society and uh, definitely having an impact on clubs 
we'll talk about financial, the financial aspect of private clubs in the link to governance. And we'll also take a look at COVID and what COVID's uh, impact has been on the industry thus far this year. So as Kevin said, uh, we founded Club Benchmarking in 2009. I am a golf nut to be clear at the beginning of the webinar. And you'll also hear that I have my Boston accent, as Kevin said. Um, but I, I love golf. I belong to the club I belong to for about 21 years. Uh, it's a golf only club, one of the better golf clubs in the country, a tremendous golf club. I will say things today that, uh, you know, maybe expand the view of the club beyond golf. Uh, as you know, most of the clubs in the MGA have other amenities and services besides golf purely. Um, and we'll, we'll learn some stuff about that. <clears throat> but I just like to put on the table that my bearing, you know, my view is uh, golf is probably the, the best game, the greatest game ever invented. And, I, and I'm a, a deeply involved in it and I love it. Uh, as Kevin said in the introduction, everything that we talk about today is informed by data. Uh, the data that we've aggregated and now studied for about 11 years uh, across North America. Our database comprises about a thousand private clubs. It's 80% clubs with golf, 20% clubs without golf. So that would be like a city club, athletic, city athletic club or a yacht club. Uh, all we do really at club benchmarking is we, we aggregate various aspects of data and then we study it. And we're, we're looking for the fact-based view of what drives success or lack thereof in the industry. I also get to do many, many board presentations. I've been in front of over 500 boards in 44 or 50 states. And so those patterns also inform what we do. Um, but I have noticed just in general, the one clear pattern that exists in the industry is that the clubs that do very well financially are the ones that really are constantly looking forward and driving forward. Across the whole industry, one of the biggest issues has been frankly, the lack of change or the pace of change in that it doesn't, the change does not exist or the pace of change is slow in relation to society at large. One of the big issues in that regard is the demographic shift. The average age to join a private club based on our own research and the research of a company called the McMahon Group who has surveyed over a million club members in the last 30 years, uh, the average age is outdated in these lines exactly, is 42 years old. So 42 year olds in 2020 are generation Xers. And in the next few years, that'll shift to millennials. So you can see that the folks that drive the future, not the people who are currently members like Myself, I'm 62, I'm a baby boomer, but the people who will drive the future success in clubs are obviously the younger generations. And what the younger generations desire and or want or need from clubs is different than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And, and that just keeps you know pace with the change in society. And that's the change that clubs need to be more in tune with is the societal changes as represented by the shifting demographics in the younger generations. If you look at the state of the industry, in particular, when we entered the virus crisis in March, uh, we wrote a white paper that pertained to how we thought clubs should react to the virus crisis. The industry very organically, I mean, we didn't cause this, we just have the data that shows it, uh, but it sorts itself into three buckets, what we call red bucket, yellow bucket, and green bucket clubs. A quarter of the industry, clubs are literally shrinking. Their assets, their total financial assets are shrinking. And that, what, what that really manifests is that they are not reinvesting in their capital assets at a rate 
that keeps those assets fresh and up to date. So their physical assets are literally depreciating and deteriorating. These red bucket clubs, if you will, are literally, and I mean it literally, are consuming themselves. On the other end of the spectrum, we have green bucket clubs, which is about a quarter of the industry. Those are the clubs that have a wait list. Those are the clubs with the highest initiation fees. And those are the clubs that are generating enough capital to continuously reinvest and reinvigorate their club. We refer to them as growing with purpose, purposeful growth. Those are the clubs that are embracing change. They're dynamic. They're the ones with the, the constantly evolving vision. So they look different today than they did 10 years ago. And then you got half the industry in the middle there that they're evolving. They're just evolving more slowly than the green bucket clubs. On the side next to the red bucket clubs, they're evolving very slowly. And on the side next to the green bucket clubs, they're evolving dynamically. We look at the balance sheet. We're gonna talk about this in detail this morning. Uh, one of the measures that we use to measure the strength of a club and even what bucket it falls in is the balance sheet. And there's a couple of metrics that we've discovered through our research and analysis that really are critical that every club understands that reflect very clearly the strength of the balance sheet. <clears throat> One of the patterns that we've observed, and it's not just us, it's others that uh, you know, work with the industry, the, the consulting firms or the folks that supply software to the club industry. If you look across the industry, one of the biggest issues in our view is that far too many boards are operationally oriented. So they're, they're not thinking forward. They're not thinking about strategies to meet the future, which we refer to as strategic governance. They're worried more about today and what happened last month uh, from a financial standpoint. They're, they're almost rear, 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 rear mirror looking as opposed to windshield, looking out the windshield. So we're really trying to use all that we've learned, and we've learned a ton that's really important that we don't think existed before we did what we did. What we wanna do is use that fact-based insight to try to drive the industry from an operational governance orientation to a strategic governance orientation. The data shows clearly that there are several misconceptions that exist across the industry or did exist before we learned what we have. Those misconceptions are incorrect. I'm not gonna read every line on this chart. I'm guessing since many of the folks on this uh, webinar are involved in governance in their own club, those misconceptions are, are ones that you've heard or even debated or discussed in your own board or committee meetings. <clears throat> the biggest one, which we just finished a, what we believe is a, a game-changing white paper on the topic, is about what we call a food and beverage trap. And there's way too much focus and concern about the financial outcome in food and beverage across the industry. And we'll talk about that a little bit as well today. So that's some context to uh, tackle club finances with. So what we do when we gather this data from all these clubs is we homogenize it. Our database is a true apples to apples database. We figured out two years after we started the company, and if we didn't figure this out, I wouldn't be here today with you, but we figured out how to get all of the financial data from a club, most of the survey data that's been used historically, most of, I would say all of the survey data that's been used, uh, aggregated historically, has been uh, submitted in a manner that we call self-entry, where clubs are asked questions like, what's your dues revenue, what's your food and beverage revenue, and they answer the question. We did that for the first two years of our existence and realized it does not work, it's not scalable, it's not accurate, and it's not comprehensive. You can't ask all of the possible questions you need to to get that data. So what we do is we get the trial balance from every club in an Excel spreadsheet 
which is essentially the chart of accounts from every single club. And we take that, we've developed software and processes that allow us to map the trial balance into our database so that we get the entire financial profile from every club. It's accurate, it's the same, balance, uh, the same data that the auditors use to, to audit the clubs and that it's comprehensive, it covers everything. And then we map it into an apples to apples format. In that apples to apples format, on the income statement, we segregate the operating ledger from the capital ledger. The capital ledger is the income that comes from initiation fees, capital dues and or capital assessments that come and go, any other investment or capital income. And it's also the ledger where the depreciation falls. 90% of the clubs in the industry set the operating ledger, which is essentially the income statement. Most of the money flows through it, but 90% of the clubs in the country set that to break even, excluding depreciation, which is over on the capital ledger. For any of you familiar with the finances of a club, I think you know exactly what this means and it's highly likely. Nine out of 10 chance you do the exact same thing at your own club. In our model, we get a bottom line result, the net operating result, what we call net available capital result, and then the change in net worth for every single club every single year. And it's those bottom line results that help perform or provide insight that allows us to start digging deeper. But to be clear as well, we also have all the detail on revenue by department. We, we work in what we call a gross profit or gross margin oriented model where the fixed operating expenses, as you see here, are separated from the, the expenses that are directly related to producing the given revenue. The capital and operating ledges are segregated, but they do intersect. They intersect in this manner. If a club has an operating deficit, it must be funded. So clubs use capital in that situation to fund the operating deficit. And if there's an operating surplus, that money essentially gets tossed back over the wall and is available uh, for capital. There's a purpose for each of the two ledges. We're gonna go into this in detail. It's a critical, critical point. It took us seven years and we work our we work hard at club benchmarking. This didn't fall out of the sky. It's only the result of significant effort and analysis. But there's a purpose for each of the two ledgers. The purpose of the operating ledger, <clears throat> excuse me, is to operate the club. And by definition, that money is consumed year in and year out by operating the club. While most of the money Rock falls through the operating ledger, the operating ledger is not the financial driver of a club. By definition, if it's set to break even, it isn't a financial driver. The capital ledger is the financial driver of a club. It's capital income and capital investment that persists from a financial perspective over time, financially. If there's not enough capital, what happens is the members' equity declines. Think of those red bucket clubs where they're literally shrinking. And the footprint, the physical footprint doesn't expand and the assets become depreciated and depleted over time. If there's not enough money on the operating ledger, what suffers is the member experience. We also, seven, uh, through, through the first seven years or so, we didn't benchmark the balance sheet. Uh, I wish I could tell the story, but I can't for the sake of time. But I have personally have had a couple of epiphanies on this journey. The first one was to start the company, but around seven years in, after working and studying all this data, there was another epiphany. And that epiphany was the importance of the balance sheet and understanding the balance sheet story, the story it tells of what's happened at your club over its period, over its history. So we benchmarked the balance sheet now. We first looked at the income statement in the past, for the last four or five years. I go to the balance sheet first, 
if you do it enough, and I hope to get some of the concepts across this morning, but once we're familiar with the balance sheet and the KPIs on the balance sheet, key performance indicators, there's actually a story to be told that relates to the culture of the club by just by merely looking at the balance sheet. And we'll take a look at that this morning. There are five best practices, we believe. These best practices are critical and, and important for every single club. Frankly, I haven't seen these documented anywhere until we discovered them. This is new stuff. Uh, it's new stuff based on the fact that we have all this data and we study it. I'm gonna quickly go through the five best practices. The operating ledger is not the financial driver. It's the vehicle for delivering services and amenities to the members. It's consumed year in and year out by members enjoying the club. The expenses that we allocate to operate the club are driven by choice, not by whether we're efficient or not efficient. Second, the financial driver is the capital ledger. It's capital income that's the source of money a club has to drive itself forward financially over time. Clubs don't get into trouble because they have issues on the operating ledger. They get into trouble because they have issues on the capital ledger, which we'll talk about and I will quantify. Every club, like every business and every family, must increase net worth over time. On a club's balance sheet, net, net worth represents members' equity. It's the equity portion of the balance sheet. Half of the clubs in the industry are seeing members' equity since the prior to the last recession, 08, 09. Since 2006, half the clubs in the country have seen members' equity shrink in real dollar terms after inflation. The key to sustainable financial success in a club, based on what we've learned, is a comprehensive forward-looking capital plan, which I'll go into in detail. And then finally, the fifth point in the data shows this. I'm gonna back every one of these best practices by showing you the data that leads us to the conclusion. Clubs compete on value, not price. In the 0809 meltdown, far too many clubs, roughly half the industry, began to compete on price, not on the member experience. It's been 12 years since that last meltdown. We have the data that shows what I believe is conclusively that you can't compete on price. We have to compete on the member experience. But with that, let's take a look at the operating ledger. You know, the first thing I just want to say is, and look, in, in the MGA, in the Long Island, the Metropolitan, up, you know, uh, Westchester County, uh, Northern New Jersey, in your district, you have some of the hot clubs with the highest initiation fees in the country. We know that. But you also have clubs that have literally closed their doors or sold, the members sold the club to some subset of members because they've had difficulty. So you have the same gamut that exists in the industry. And, and the thing that allows us to do what I do, which I want to emphasize, is that when you look at the financial model of a club, it doesn't matter if it's in New York. Let's say it's one of the highest cost of living, if not the highest cost of living area of the country. That doesn't change any of this. And when you look at the financial model of a club, and you look at the two ledges, the operating and capital ledger, the sources and the uses of money are the same, regardless of where the club is in this country or North America, regardless of what type of club it is, a yacht club or a, or a country club. That's what allows us to benchmark the data in a homogeneous manner in this industry. On the operating ledger, what we have found, and some of this is counterintuitive, that's why we need data. Before our, this data existed, people made poor decisions because of the lack of understanding, truly understanding the fundamental drivers. There's a, there's, in our for-profit business background, before I started this company, I spent 30 plus 35 years in high technology. I had my own companies. I ran companies for venture capitalists and private equity folks. 
we've all been trained in our business background that we are supposed to cut expenses, manage expenses, efficiency. Profit is bad, a profit is good, loss is bad. We, we, these are things that are ingrained in us, but they don't apply uniformly in every industry. Every industry is built on its own key success factors. What drives the expense in clubs is the member experience and the footprint. You know, in the MGA, there are some clubs that comprise 100 acres, 18 holes of golf, tiny clubhouse, small parking lot, and nothing but golf. Those clubs have less expenses. There's other clubs, I'm thinking of Westchester right now, that are huge, huge clubs, massive amounts of amenities, massive member counts, big footprints, hundreds of acres. The point is that the expenses go up in concert with the member experience and the scale of the footprint. And, and you know, this is a real club. This is a club in Richmond, Virginia. Most clubs would kill for one of these pools. They have three of them back to back. Behind the words on this, on this uh, slide, there's a 32,000 square foot indoor tennis fitness, physical therapy, dining, whatever you want to do, center. It has rock climbing walls in it. This club has a lot of expense, but it has a big footprint. And it's the big footprint in all that member experience that comes with it that allows this club to be one of the most successful clubs in the country. Strategic governance is oriented towards educating our fellow members that we must properly fund our footprint. There are no shortcuts. Operational governance is oriented towards cutting the costs of funding the footprint. It doesn't work over time. Part of the epiphany that we had five years ago after seven years of doing this, this is the most important thing I've learned since we started the company, is this chart. I have to get the concept across. The blue line, remember on that chart I showed earlier, represents the operating result. So you, we don't sh show averages, except in one particular case. We show the entire variation. We believe that benchmarking is all about illuminating the variation that exists and understanding what drives or causes the variation. That's the way we learn. So we just use a what we call a scatter plot, which is a percentile ranking. So this shows the operating result. This is last fiscal year. There's about 700 clubs with golf on this chart. The median is 0%. So that says that club in the middle had an operating outcome that was equal to 0% of its operating revenue, the operating margin. It's break even, literally, to the dollar. We say at club benchmarking, anything between minus four and plus four is the break-even zone. That's 70% of the clubs in the database. This is the data that conclusively demonstrates that the operating ledger is not the financial driver. The operating ledger is, cons is consumed year in and year out by members enjoying the club. Critical point. The goal line <clears throat> puts in the same context the capital income. So this club at the middle that broke even operationally had capital income equal to 15% of the operating revenue. It's the capital income that's the pile of money that we have to drive a club forward financially. Another point, we with our business backgrounds, and I see this constantly as I make my way around the industry, so coming at it and speaking to, I know, a, a group of people who are involved and instrumental in governance in their clubs, and I'm talking to the presidents or the treasurers or the VPs, folks who are on the board, we come into the boardroom with different perspectives. One of the issues in governance from my pers personal experience is that we don't all, as board members, try to learn about the club industry before we make decisions 
or demand outcomes from the staff managing the club. We should learn about the industry before we come to conclusions. This is a pervasive issue. There is a theory that many of us who are involved in governance have, and I understand the genesis of the theory. Unfortunately, the theory is incorrect. This is what we'll show with this data. The theory is this, that we would be better off with lower expenses than higher expenses. That's what I call the efficiency view. Well, if that's true, the clubs that have the lowest expenses should be the healthiest in the industry, and the clubs with the highest expenses should be the weakest in the industry. This chart shows the total operating expenses per full member equivalent. That's a way we rationalize the various membership categories across clubs. It's a homogenization of member counts. So the lower quartile, right here, you see the 25th percentile, Clubs are spending $13,000 or less per full member equivalent. The upper quartile, clubs are spending $22,400 or more per full member equivalent on the operating ledger. Well, the clubs that are in the lower quartile, ones with the lowest expenses, the median initiation fee is $7,000. The median member count is 300. We have a way to measure, I'll get into it in a few minutes, whether a club is properly capitalized or not. Three quarters of these clubs are undercapitalized and the extent of the undercapitalization in this bucket is severe. The upper quartile, the median initiation fee, $70,000, 10 times higher. The member count, 800 versus 300, almost three times higher. Only a third of these clubs are undercapitalized and the extent of the undercapitalization in this bucket is marginal, not significant. These clubs are much healthier financially than the clubs with the lower expenses. That's a critical point. I've seen it, I've seen it in my own club, I've seen it in the 500 plus clubs I've worked with. There is a proportion of us who come into governance believing our job is to help the staff cut costs and manage expenses. It doesn't work, it's the wrong answer. The right answer is how do we spend more per member? How do we have a better member experience? Clubs compete on the experience, not on the price. The clubs that are closing their doors are the ones without initiation fees and the lowest dues. There is not a price low enough to entice people to join a club with a crappy member experience, and there's not a price high enough to dissuade people from joining a club with a tremendous member experience. This is an eye chart. I'm not gonna go into all the detail. There's a ton of information here, but the point of the chart is to show that yellow pie slice, the, the pie chart represents the allocation of fixed operating expenses by department. The yellow pie slice is the amount of money allocated to non-golf sports. So that's rackets, fitness, tennis, aquatics, et cetera. The more money allocated to non-golf sports, the higher the member counts, the higher the initiation fee as you move to the right. These clubs don't spend less maintaining the golf course. They actually spend more, but they also spend more on non-golf sports. The point is this, it's the breadth of services and amenities that drive the member experience and the outcome in the end in clubs. And then finally on the operating ledger, one of the biggest issues and anyone involved in governance, I think would agree that you talk about this in your boardroom is the profit or loss in F and B. What this shows the way we measure the ultimate financial outcome of F and B in clubs is what proportion of the dues revenue is used to subsidize the F&B department. So when you see 0% on this chart, 
Those are the clubs that break even in F and B. And you got to go all the way out to the 80th percentile to get to break even, which means 80% of the clubs in the industry are subsidizing their F and B operation. 20% aren't. They generate a surplus in F and B. But when you look at the quartiles, the lower quartile is the quarter of the industry that subsidizes F and B using 12% or more of its dues revenue. In the upper quartile, those are the clubs that are using very little dues revenue to subsidize F and B, 3% or less. So these are the clubs breaking even and making a profit. The median initiation fee in this group of clubs is 14. 750, the median initiation fee in the group of clubs subsidizing F&B the most is $50,000, almost four times higher. Food and beverage is an amenity, not a profit center, just like any other amenity, including golf in the club. We've done deep analysis. When you look at the expenses across a club, most of the expenses are necessary and fixed. Real estate taxes, property and liability insurance, interest on debt. You have to pay the GM. You have to pay the head of finance. You have to pay the executive chef, the superintendent, the head golf professional, et cetera. If you bucket the expenses and you were to take 40% of all hourly labor, 40% of all cost of goods, and 40% of all supplies and chemicals across the club, and say that they may not be necessary, they may be superfluous, and you go through an exercise, about 30% of the overall expense could be designated as related to efficiency, but it's 30%, that's it, it's a third. But then you have to go one step further with the thought exercise. If you have two clubs next to each other, one's grossly inefficient related to the other, what would that mean in 2020? Grossly inefficient, they spend, 20%, 25% more doing the same thing. Seems like a fair uh, threshold. That's only 25% of the 30, which is 7.5%. Very little of the expense in clubs is oriented towards efficiency. What it drives the expense, again, is the scale of the footprint and the member experience we deliver. And the better that is, the healthier the club is. It's not about efficiency. It's a high fixed cost industry, just like airlines. I fly constantly. Before the pandemic, every plane was full. Now, half full max, most of the planes. It costs the same to fly the plane from point A to B. Clubs are the same. It's a high fixed cost industry. And we're not the only industry that competes only on value. There are many industries, Apple, Google, Gucci, Cartier, these aren't companies competing on, industries competing on price. They compete on the value they deliver. That's what clubs are like. We're not commodities where, where it's an industry based on the price or competing on the price. On the operating ledger, one of the most critical metrics is the dues to operating revenue ratio. Those clubs that are leveraged in an operating sense have a dues to revenue ratio of 45% or under. Clubs have to cover the fixed operating expenses one of two ways, either through dues revenue, which is 100% gross margin. There is no direct cost associated with dues revenue, or they have to generate money, the margin on non-dues revenue. That's the way we cover costs. Dues revenue or the margin on non-dues revenue. The approach that any one club has embraced has evolved over time in that club. It tends to even be embedded in the culture of that club. I can tell you, I know this club well. In our charts, the, the subject club is represented as the large circle. It's embedded in the culture of this club to keep the dues low. And that's why they have a leveraged operating model. So this club works their tail off to generate margin on non-dues revenue that's enough to cover the fixed operating expenses. On the other end of the spectrum, if you have a club with a high ratio, those have a dues-centric operating model 
and they aren't relying on the margin on non-news revenue. When you have a situation where you're relying on the margin on, I'm sorry, on the margin on non-dues revenue, it's the heavier users of the club that's uh, subsidizing the cost for the less frequent users. When you get into a due centric club, then the costs are more equally spread out fairly amongst all the members because it's dues. Another example of an operating KPI is the payroll to revenue ratio. Oftentimes I get queried in, when I'm in front of boards about, hey, uh, you know, we might have too many people, we pay them too much, whatever. We can't judge that without data. The payroll to revenue ratio, in our view of the world, is the surest way to have a data-driven view of, of our most dear asset, which is our human capital. And that's what drives the member experience. So that's an introduction to the operating ledger. Summary, clubs compete on value, not price. Higher expenses, not lower, is better. It's not about efficiency. It's about the member experience. We don't have profit centers. We have amenities. And we should be subsidizing those amenities to make them as compelling as we can so that we can attract and retain members. Let's take a look now at the capital ledger and the balance sheet, which is the financial driver. There's a couple of critical metrics, net available capital, in the change in net worth, which we'll get into. Since clubs set the operating ledger to break even and put depreciation expense on the capital ledger, then if you look at the change in net worth, the only way it's going to go up is as if there is enough capital, net available capital, to overcome the depreciation expense. If it is, the net worth will go up. If it isn't, the net worth will go down. We need the net worth to go up. We have about 800 clubs on this curve, and it shows the compounded annual growth rate, Hager, of members' equity since 2006. So the median for the industry is 2.3%, which is just barely inflation. So half of the industry on the left side of this curve, the members' equity is either shrinking in absolute dollars or growing less than the rate of inflation. These clubs are going backwards. Half the industry is going backwards. On the other end of the spectrum, when you look at the green bucket clubs, the clubs that are doing really well, their members' equity is growing. We use the club in Charlotte, North Carolina as a besting class, a besting case approach to the member experience, they have a compounded annual growth rate of members' equity since 2006 of almost 8%, 7.8%. Because members' equity reflects capital income, which I've already shown, and because that's the money we have to reinvest in the asset base, well, ultimately what members' equity does is it reflect, reflects our ability to reinvest in our property, plant, and equipment. We'll, we'll talk about this in detail. Here's the tale of two cities. Here's Carmel with their best in class growth of net worth. This is a real club. One of the top legacy clubs in this country. If you made a list 25, 20 years ago of the best country clubs in the largest cities in the country, this club would be in the top 100. It's a meltdown. This is their members equity, literally for the last, since 2006. They're literally consuming themselves. They're on a trajectory to going out of business. Couple of points. Most clubs don't even measure this metric. It took us seven years to discover it. It's the most important financial metric. We perform for any club a free service. We will do your net worth and balance sheet benchmark for free. It takes about a day. It's as easy as can be. So if you're interested, let us know. Why is members' equity important? Well, here's the average balance sheet of a club. I gotta keep my eye on the time here. Um, the average club is in yellow. So the average club, when you look at the where the money came from, 70% flows from members' equity and 30% from liabilities. In the club world, 
Liabilities are basically bank debt. That's what most of liabilities represent. Yeah, there's AP, some short-term liabilities, but they're not significant. The average club is 70% equity, 30% liabilities with a debt to equity ratio of 20%. And that debt to equity means third party, traditional third party debt. Okay, it's not uh, membership bonds as an example. It's just lease debt, bank debt, lines of credits, mortgage debt. When you look at that we club, this is actually the same club, the club that has declining members equity. Look at them, they're 10% equity, 90% liabilities. They have a 450% debt to equity ratio. And when you look at a strong club, this is an actual club, has a uh, bet, the upper quartile compound annual growth rate of members equity is 5% or higher. This club's in the upper quartile. They're 90% equity, 9% liabilities. They don't have any bank debt. That's because they have enough capital from their members to fund their property, plant, and equipment. Now, the, the interesting thing is when you get to the other side of the balance sheet, this is the whole point. 80% of the assets at the average club end up on one line item, and that line item is the net book value of property, plant, and equipment, what it's worth after all depreciation. That's 80% of the assets. So we have to treat that property, plant, and equipment with very delicate gloves. We better understand it well, and I'm going to show you a metric in a minute to, to handle that. But the, but the thing that's interesting is all three buckets, the weak club, the strong club, and the average, all of them end up with about 80% of their assets in property, plant, and equipment. The only push and take is how much is in cash. Because those two line items, property, plant, and equipment, and cash at the average club end up as 90% of our assets. And you can see it's very consistent. We have discovered during this epiphany a metric we call the net to gross property plant and equipment ratio. It's just the after depreciation value of our assets divided by the original procurement cost. Every club's going to have a ratio between zero and 100 percent. This shows 800 clubs. The median for the industry is 46. So that says the average club as a asset base that's about halfway through its depreciated life. We think the club should have a ratio of 55% or higher. The strong club has a ratio of 65. That weak club, even with that high debt to equity ratio, has a ratio of 38, almost in the lower quartile. Anything under 40, we give a red flag. 40 to 55, we give a yellow flag. And over 55, we give a green flag. So when you think about with this data now, the flow of money in a club, the operating ledge is consumed. It's not the financial driver. Capital income and capital investment persist over time and can be measured by measuring the extent of the depreciation in the asset base using the net to gross PP&E ratio. Three quarters of the clubs in the country are under the threshold we believe they should be at, 55% or higher. Three quarters of the clubs in the country are not generating the capital that's necessary to repair and replace their assets. So what's the key to sustainable financial success when we see this? You know, the first thing is understanding the model, the, the, the system diagram of a club. The financial outcome is based on the membership engine. Do we have enough members and are we charging them enough to deliver the proper member experience and to be able to reinvest in the capital base? That's as simple as that. Since the last meltdown, 08, 09, what happened is half the industry went the wrong way. They tried to cut the prices that members paid vis-a-vis -vis initiation fees or dues and they weren't generating enough money, so their financial position is not strong. But the membership engine isn't an island unto itself. It relates to the value proposition, which we just saw from all the data, is one aspect is the services and amenities we deliver to the members, the programming, 
which manifests on the operating ledger, our physical asset base, which manifests on the capital ledger and the balance sheet, and our staff and the engagement of our staff in delivering a member experience. There's a culture in every club. On one end, I find clubs where people think as owners and they understand this mechanism and they understand if the club needs capital, we gotta contribute it. And on the other end, we have members who think transactionally as customers and all they want is the member experience the lowest possible price. It doesn't work that way. We need our members to think of themselves as they are. They're the owners of the club. We are the owners of the club. There's two types of capital that exist in every club, obligatory and aspirational. Obligatory is maintenance capital, repair and replacing the assets we have. Aspirational is growth capital, expansion to or addition to the asset base. Couple of examples. You all know there's been a recent trend to put learning centers at golf clubs, on the driving range, with simulators, with track mans, with bays with the ability to hit out and, and, and you know characterize our swings. If you don't have a learning center today and you wanna put one in, that's growth capital. On the other side of the coin, if you're replacing an irrigation system in the course, that's, at, that's obligatory capital. The problem we have as the club world is we spend too much time focused on the operating ledger, which means we don't actually quantify precisely what our future capital needs are. Every club should be doing that by having a capital reserve study done professionally so that they know exactly what the obligatory capital needs are for the next 20 years so that we can create a plan to ask our owners to contribute capital so that we'll meet those needs. The worst thing we can do is go get bank debt to replace obligatory capital. Because what we're doing is we're shifting the obligation from the members who consumed it to future members who are going to pay the bank back. It happens all the time. We have a significant number of metrics, processes, approaches for clubs to be able to plan for their capital future. We're trying to get the industry out of assessments that are hurtful. Assessments are an indication of reactive capital planning rather than proactive capital planning. Every club should have a comprehensive, forward-looking capital plan that addresses all of the key drivers in a club. This is an example, one out of about 30 uh, templates or spreadsheets we use in the capital planning process that we have. This is the overall capital cash flow summary. It's a 10 year view. We model 10 years out and we need to begin aggregating the capital today so that we have the capital to meet the future. And that's what separates ultimately green bucket clubs from red bucket clubs is the adequate capital to reinvest and reinvent. Okay, uh, let's take a quick look at what's going on in the financial realm of clubs as a result of the virus. So we saw earlier from the dues to revenue ratio that the median for the industry is 50% of, of the revenue comes from operating dues, the operating revenue, and 50% comes from non-dues. But when it comes to covering the fixed expenses, 80% of the fixed expense is covered from the dues revenue, and only 20% from the margin on non-dues revenue. So dues revenue is the fundamental engine to drive the operating ledger. As we'd expect, dues revenue year over year, this shows uh, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, we have about 300 clubs now. We have a free service. We call it the Strategic Monthly Dashboard, where clubs can track certain high-level metrics that are critical uh, month, of, month to month. So this shows the year-over-year -year change, 2020 versus 2019, for dues revenue. And we picked up more clubs during the virus. 
So this decline is really uh, indicating a broader participation. You can see that about three to three and a half percent is the typical year over year change in dues revenue in a club. And, and the dues revenue has held strong throughout the virus, which is good news. Non-dues revenue, as we might expect, which is food and beverage revenue is the main component. That's both member dining and, alloc and, and banquet dining. And then outings, green fees revenue, and cot revenue. Those are the main contributors of non-dues revenue in clubs without golf, I and mean, clubs with golf. You can see that it started, this is March, it was down 30% because we came into the lockdown halfway through the month. It hit 66% decline in April. And you can see we've climbed our way back out. Clubs with golf are doing well in regards to the non-dues revenue in relation to clubs without golf. Golf obviously has been a beneficiary of the virus and the associated move to home offices. It's a heck of a lot easier to sneak out and play nine or 18 from the home office than it is from the actual office. That's probably a trend we will see persist into the future. No one could have predicted it in my mind that golf would have been the perfect social distance sport during the virus, but it's turned out that way and the data supports that. The key point here is though, the non-dues revenue really isn't gonna be coming back to where it was probably ever, but certainly not through the middle of 2021. So what's happened is, and this goes back to the dues to revenue ratio, those clubs with the leveraged operating model historically have begun to lean on trying to cover their operating expenses, not by asking their owners for the dues, but by trying to do it on non-dues margin. Okay, the way the thing is shaken out, when we're looking at our 2021 budgets, we really have a huge opportunity. This is turning the virus into a opportunity in clubs to create a member centric budget. It might mean the dues have to go up a bit more than normal for our members, but that makes for a healthier club. We're better off trying to cover our expenses through dues revenue than non dues margin. It's simple and it's not significant for most clubs. Our estimate is the average club with an increase of somewhere around 8% on dues could even live without that margin on non dues revenue. And then you have a club that's built for the members. We don't have to be bringing in banquets, we don't have to rely on 14 or 20 golf outings. It's a critical point. I, you know, I, I love data for a reason. Data really gives us the view of what's happening, not what we think is happening. I'm on the phone all day long, managers all across the country, board members all across the country. I'm on webinars with the industry, doing them and listening to them. The conventional wisdom is, that clubs have all taken in new members. It's not what the data shows. First off, you got a quarter of the clubs that already had a wait list. So their member count hasn't changed as a result of the virus. Not all clubs are succeeding because of the virus. Some are actually losing members. This is a distribution for August. The membership count changed year over year for the 300, uh, probably about, I'm sorry, 260 clubs 40 clubs with golf, 20% of non-golf. You can see the median, the member counts flat. Some clubs have gained members, no doubt about it, but a lot of clubs have also lost members. So there's always a picture to be told when we have the data. And we need that data to make the right decisions. Because if you're hearing every club's gaining members and you're in a club that's losing members, you think you're alone, but you're not alone. This is about 40%. 40% of the clubs on the margin have fewer members and 40% have on the margin a few more members, but 20% are flat, 25% clubs with the waiting list. The one thing that we have other metrics that we track monthly, I'm only picking a few that I thought would be pertinent for, the, for this meeting. But what we're seeing here is the total capital investment for the 
the 260 clubs participating, we're just looking at the aggregate amount of capital investment. And you can see that it's below last year. Our contention is that clubs are likely restricting capital investment as a reaction to the virus. We aren't fans of that strategy, frankly. We think that's being short-term oriented, but I get why we would do it. But the data shows that it's probably happening. On the other hand, you can see almost the fact that, yeah, we were declining more rapidly when, uh, and again, February, March, we had a lot of clubs joined, so that might be the data. But um, you can see it declining when we were in lockdown. And since we've come out, maybe clubs are loosening up the uh, purse strings. Purse strings. So a couple more points, and uh, we're looking like we're a pretty good time. And then I hope there's some questions in, in dialogue. But you know, just in summary, look, the virus came out of left field, obviously. It's been a catalyst for change. We should embrace it as a means of delivering a more member-centric budget and experience for 2021. Let's get out of the reliance or the leaning towards trying to operate the club on non-dues revenue. Let's just fund the club the way it needs to be from the members contributing the fair share of dues revenue to run the club properly on the margin I'm talking. I'm not telling any club to double their, their dues. I'm just saying if you're making a decision between cutting the expense on the operating ledger, which is going to cut the member experience, or increasing the dues, let's increase the dues. It's a better decision on the margin. The virus has accelerated societal changes. BlackRock Investments had their earnings call yesterday. They had a line in there that I love. Prior to the pandemic, they had 16,000 people working in 60 offices worldwide. Now they have 16,000 people working in 16,000 offices worldwide, and they don't think it's going to change. They believe it's actually a catalyst for good things for their company. They've seen no change in operating efficiency, meaning the work that's getting done, but they believe that mem uh, uh, employees have two or three hours more a day to live a healthier life. Their members are healthier. They can work out more. They can play golf more. They can do lots of other things besides commuting back and forth constantly. That helps cities. It helps congestion of traffic. There's clubs in New York and the Metropolitan Golf Association where members want to try and get to the club and traffic is an inhibitor. I think traffic's going to be reduced in the future because of this change. This change is never going to be, we're not putting this genie back in the bottle. There's going to be less people working in offices after than there were before. That's a given. So there's a lot of change occurring in society. These slides, by the way, I had before the pandemic. The issue is in clubs, we don't think innovatively enough. We have to think more innovatively about keeping up with the changes in society. Golf is a core amenity in our country clubs. I get it, I'm an avid golfer, but it isn't the only amenity. We really have to think broadly and strategically about what we want to deliver so that we are gaining those 42 year members, 42 year old members, so that we can attract and retain them. We want the club to be dynamic. We want our clubs to evolve. I know it causes friction, between the older members and the younger members, but we have to evolve. And the virus has given us an opportunity to accelerate changes that are healthy in our clubs. At Club Benchmarking, we're lifelong learners. And I think Kevin will have these slides to disseminate to the attendees. This is just some of the stuff we've been reading recently. We think a lot about strategy in clubs in having the right forward-looking strategies to make the future healthy. There's some great, great insight in this. This is stuff we've been looking at this year. So in summary, I just go back over the five best practices. The operating ledger isn't the financial driver. It's the vehicle for delivering services and a members to the membership. It's consumed year in and year out by members enjoying the club. The expenses are driven by choices regarding how we fund the footprint in the member experience, not by whether we're efficient or not. That's definitive. 
If we have a different view and we're involved in governance, we should change our view to match reality. I know this sounds sacrosanct, by the way, I get it. I'm just reading the data. The financial driver is the capital ledger. If we're worried about the member experience, look to the operating ledger. If we're worried about the finances of our club, look to the capital ledger, capital income, and forward-looking capital needs. We have to grow net worth adequately over time. It must grow at at least, in our view, a 3.5% per year rate over a sustained period in order to meet forward-looking obligatory capital needs. The only way we will meet our forward-looking capital needs properly is to proactively construct a comprehensive forward-looking capital plan. We believe that's the root of sustainable financial success. And I believe that less than 5% of the clubs in the country have what I would refer to as a comprehensive forward-looking capital plan. And then finally, clubs compete on value, not price. We saw it, the data shows it, it's real. The clubs with the highest dues and the highest initiation fees have the wait lists and the full membership rosters. The ones with the lowest dues and the lowest initiation fees, the ones that need the members the most. Strategic governance is focused on making sure we make the right cho choices that will drive future success. So please use financial data like this to shift from an operating orientation in the boardroom to a strategic orientation. I thank you uh, for your time, and I hope there's some questions out there. Ray, I'll let you sip that Diet Pepsi. That was uh, great. Really appreciate it. The passion came through, and uh, you know, just in the the question response boxes and emails I've gotten throughout the last hour. I think everyone appreciates the time that you spent with us today. Um, we're gonna unmute everyone. If you have any questions, please, I think we're all used to these virtual calls. Uh, just try not to speak over one another, but we're here for a few more minutes. If you have any questions for Ray, please feel free to ask of him any questions you have. As he mentioned, we will share the recording and the PowerPoint slides with everyone that joined us today a little bit later this afternoon. Just a reminder that we do have another session at 12 o'clock noon with Adam Miller of the USGA, Education Director of the Green Section. So hope you can join us for that. Um, Ray, just a, a question from someone who came in is, um, is there any advice for some non-equity clubs and golf cl clubs to focus on? Uh, yeah, so I assume that when we say non-equity, we either mean uh, potentially public clubs or um, clubs that are not owned by the membership but are owned by an individual or third party. Uh, yeah, my advice would be we've done enough work to believe this is true because we, we actually over the years have also aggregated data from public facilities. And we think everything that we just said, or I just said, we believe uh, applies in the public realm and certainly it applies as well in the for-profit or third-party owned club world. So capital planning is essential even in those facilities. And I think anyone running such a facility would agree uh, that, that what tends to happen is if we don't generate the adequate capital and we start to defer maintenance year after year after year, we get further and further behind and it gets harder and harder to resurrect ourselves to catch up with the deferred maintenance. So the forward-looking capital plan is still critical. The point that we compete on value, not price, still critical. And the, the, the point that, in, the only difference would be that, you know, in, in, the, in, the, not, in the third party owned private club or the public realm, that separation of operating and capital ledger isn't going to be as distinct as it is in the in the member-owned club, but it still exists. So clubs that are in that realm have to consider making sure they not only generate the money to operate, but they have enough of a profit to reinvest. They have to do two things: both reinvest properly and generate an adequate cash flow to get a return on their investment. 
So it's a little trickier for them, but 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 the points are still central and the concepts are still the same, we believe. Thanks, Ray. And yeah, to your point, I think that was uh, not from a public facility, but a non-member owned club. Uh, another uh, point question that came in is that just given the presentation, the implication was that in order to increase the net asset ratio, you need to be investing in non-golf assets in addition to the golf course, which apparently does not appear on the balance sheet. It's for that diversified member experience. Um, that's a very good question. So the the way that it would manifest on the balance sheet is this, that if you look at the, uh, using that term, I, I think net assets means the net, the value of net property, plant, and equipment. So the dollar value, the average 18 hole country club uh, has net, uh, net property, plant, and equipment that, uh, well, I'll say the median, I should say the median, that's in the, the 12, uh, $12 million range. The more golf centric the asset base, the smaller that number in the broader services and amenities to the question is point that exists, the higher that number. So if you have a golf only club or you took all golf only clubs, the median net property plant equipment would be several million dollars lower than full service broad amenity country clubs and to the question is point. The difference is the amount that's ultimately invested in those non-golf assets. All right, thank you. Uh, any questions out there from any of our participants? Uh, so, yeah. right, so if I may, I'll ahead. just mention anyone that wants us to do a net worth balance sheet benchmark for their club we do it for free it's a free service i'll send kevin an email and he can get it out with the slides and we perform that service for you i think it's mandatory information must have if we don't have it in our boardroom we're missing the big picture and we're happy to do that uh for the mga clubs well thanks Ray. we appreciate it and uh you know a thrill to have you join us today but just a question, many of our clubs, you know, they're, you touched on this, they're down in number of members and options for operating budgets and capital expenses are limited. Uh, so just maybe briefly, how do those clubs just continue to move forward? And the question that came in was just kind of budgeting for, for next season, going into next year. Yeah, it's a great question. So I think there's two points, you know, I, there's a slide here in a club that's kind of maybe in that red bucket zone over here. The key is we have to make our members slash owners realize the only way we're getting out of that kind of negative cycle is through capital investment. And the only way we're getting that money is from our current members slash owners. So we can cause the turnaround, but we can't get it out of the money we already have. We need more money. That's why we're in that situation. So we think the data helps inform clubs that need more capital. And we think the beginning of the cycle, changing the cycle, the outcome is the forward-looking capital plan. That will cause the change. And I'd say, if you're looking at your budget for 2021, we need to put money in the budget to get the forward-looking capital plan done, to get the ball rolling in the right direction, so to speak. But to be clear and to be blunt or frank, it's gonna take money from the current members and owners. That's the only way it works. There is no other way that we know. And the clubs that wait too long to make that point are the ones that end up closing their doors or having to sell to some of the members. So. Yeah, and you touched on this, but what are some of those non-golf assets or amenities that might be most effective in enhancing the club experience, maybe through some of your research? Yep, there's, uh, I would say there's three. When, when we talked about the Green Bucket Clubs and Purposeful Growth, those are clubs that have invested mainly in three areas, but they've invested significantly in those three areas in the last decade. Uh, one is the pool, resort-style pools, 
sounds crazy, but it's real because that's a family centered activity. Uh, the other one is fitness and wellness. Uh, and the third one is casual dining. So we've been probably enough of us have been in enough clubs to see. Some clubs still have the dining facilities that 30 years ago, they're just not attractive to an incoming 42 year old member. Other clubs have invested heavily. And when you walk into the grill room, it feels like a sports bar. And that's what people want. That's what people want to have. And it engages the members much more significantly than, you know, if we're walking into a, a grill room that looks like it's stuck in 1980 or 70. So those are the three areas, pools, fitness and wellness, and casual dining. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, I think uh, at this point, we will uh, let everybody get on to the rest of their day. And hopefully some of you are joining us at noon for admin session. Uh, Ray, thanks again. Appreciate everything. Like Ray mentioned, we'll send out the recording and other slides to all participants later today. Hopefully you can share that with your boards. And uh, if you have any questions, you can either reach out to Kira or myself and always get out to Ray too. So uh, thanks to everybody for joining us. Thank you to Ray. Uh, hopefully Thank we'll you. see you soon. Stay well, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.